Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> it's a great experience, really, um, and rare, too, to have been part of this uh, team, the planetary boundary uh, team and, and the papers, two, the, the two first papers. Uh, I certainly have a number of stories also to tell about this experience, and they keep accumulating, actually. As I go around the world, you enter a conference room and, and somebody's uh, showing a slide that's very familiar to you and they start talking about you. I think I feel a little bit like yeah, I always imagine these rock stars when they enter cafes on the other side of the world and hear their music being played. Uh, so, and I can't <laughs> share many stories now uh, because it's, it's uh, such a time craze here. But um, I would like to give you just one little thing here, namely that the uh, the 2009 paper, of which I'm a co-author, uh, uh, is, is the single paper of which I haven't written a word, actually. And I say this against the background of a bibliography of 1,700 numbers, dozens of books, hundreds of papers, and many articles, uh, and I wrote them and I edited them myself. But this single paper it wasn't only not peer-reviewed, it was only also not written by me. So. Uh, and I tried to, actually. Uh, the, the draft manuscript circulated. Uh, I tried to lobby in some edits and amendments, but to no avail. As I remembered it, it was all silent on the other side. Uh, and, and I'd been part of all these uh, conversations that had been mentioned, contributed to the ideas to some extent, I, I hope. So I had no uh, problems identifying with what was going on here at large. But there were certain things I wanted to add a little bit about, about responsibility, for example, the homogenization of humanity, and a certain sense of slack ontology when it came, came to what a boundary actually was, which I think was captured very nicely in this opening poem. And I would have wished to elaborate a bit further on that. Now, some of these issues actually were, <laughs> I suppose, maturing under the, under the carpet. So, uh, in the following months and years after the publication, they came up very much in the discussion worldwide, and when I got the invitation by Will to be part of the process towards the 2015 science article, he and I had always spoken already about some of the issues that were raised in, in the social sciences and the humanities about the paper, some of them pretty critical, and along the same lines as those I had articulated back in 2009. So I pondered Will's offer for a while before finally accepting. <laughs> and this time I actually it ended up writing a couple of paragraphs that I'm very proud of in a section entitled Planetary Boundaries in a Societal Context. And I cite a couple of sentences from it uh, like these. Uh, the PB approach is embedded in this emerging social context, but it does not suggest how to maneuver within the safe operating space in the quest for global sustainability. I think this was echoed also in the conversation here. For example, the PB framework does not as yet account for the regional distribution of the impact, nor of its historical patterns, nor does the PB framework take into account the deeper issues of equity and causation. The current levels of the boundary processes and the transgressions of boundaries that have already occurred are unevenly caused by different human societies and different social groups. So um, that was part of these uh, sections I referred to. Now this kind of discussion had by then been circulating quite pervasively around the Anthropocene concept, similar arguments. And one observation that I have made about the influence of planetary boundaries among the social sciences and humanities communities, let's call it that, is that in these uh, strands of the knowledge spectrum, the Anthropocene, I think, actually, has drawn more attention over the full decade here than the planetary boundaries. Uh, I have no now <laughs> no full-scale bibliometric analysis to offer on this point. Uh, it's my personal observation. Uh, and this, of course, is against the background of the 8,000 citations uh, of the uh, 2009 paper, the 4,000 citations of the, of the 2015 papers, and, and so on and so forth. Well, we should, of course, remember that Michel Foucault alone just passes, as we speak, a million citations uh, himself uh, on Google Scholar as a comparison. But I can cite, uh, and we all know about many, I suppose 20, 30 books by now on the Anthropocene, most authored by social thinkers and scholars from a range of disciplines, and also by journalists and public intellectuals. These books circulate, I think, in fairly broad markets and are widely read across disciplines and epistemic 
cultures. On planetary boundaries, uh, we have seen, I think, actually quite few books of this kind, and the concept does not seem to attract non-scientists to the same extent. And I speak again from the social science and humanities communities. There are exceptions, many exceptions, to this broad blanket statement, and I would just like to cite one, namely Bruno Latour, who is very interested in planetary, planetary boundaries. And in one of his lectures in, back in 2013, he um, uh, talks about the, the new uh, scientific world that is being created, and saying that planetary boundaries demonstrate that nothing is stable anymore. The Earth is a dynamic place because of human intervention. And then comes this, <laughs> hence objective knowledge is no longer possible. The study of science in the past, and if you know anything about Latour and his work, he spent decades researching the research process itself. The study of science in the past led to the conclusion that facts about nature were produced by scientists. That was a major finding of that work in the, back in the 70s and 80s. But now, he adds, with planetary boundaries being transgressed, humans are also producing the conditions that become the new facts. And since these conditions are constantly changes, changing, the objectivity somehow is also trembling. That's Latour, not me. I think that what has happened in the decade since 2009 is in a sense, what Bruno Latour describes here is an emerging new Weltanschauung that uh, is coming up, characterized by instability, fluidity, a shift of hegemony from nature as a hard constraint, the kind of constraints that geographers always talked about, that the big, greatest uh, historian of the 20th century, uh, uh, Fernand Brudel, was also talking about nature as the kind of hard frame on humans, that humans can do many things, but they cannot do anything because they have this constraint. Shifting to a soft, soft constraint, a human-induced constraint, planetary boundaries. And at the same time, as humanity has risen, this happens, as the ontological superpower that can exert this Archimedean ultimate force and tip the earth out of joint. So it's pretty major, I think, this idea. In my understanding, planetary boundaries has been a significant contribution to this ontological shift and has offered, we could call it systemic fuel and some empirical affirmation to the wider changes brought together under the Anthropocene concept. It is evident, I think, that the PB framework went down very well with some of the policy circles. It clearly influenced the UN, the future Earth, Agenda 2030, as we already heard, clearly seemed potentially useful for emerging planetary governance or stewardship. And I say this with particular interest, since I'm now in a new um, ERC, Advanced Grant Project, I'm actually uh, exploring uh, the history of uh, global environmental governance. Very exciting work, uh, I think. It was also too easy to read the PB framework as an invitation to changes in governance, precisely. But to move from the potential to the operational uh, is, of course, not always easy. And when scaled down, uh, we heard about this in the conversation as well, to regions, nations and localities, several of these framework dimensions offer less concrete guidance. Uh, in my view, and this has been repeatedly addressed in research, it keeps being researched, but my impression is that some of these challenges here remain. Now, the Anthropocene, I think in some distinction here, uh, arrived with less of these ambitions. Its main thrust was always to make it fully known and established that humans were the strongest force on the geological scale, and it has invited a quite different kind of imagery, uh, uh, I think, than the planetary boundaries framework. Uh, and the PB, of course, the message of, of, of PB was always that, lo and behold, if we don't change as humanity, we will bring our system outside the guardrails of the Holocene. And, and I think PB had this, always this managerial tinge to it. 
which I think made it attractive in policy circles, but perhaps less interesting to those that thought more in terms of imaginaries. Charles Taylor's wonderful concept or were more prone to religious, say, or metaphysical overtones. Uh, now, in the years that have passed since 2009, apocalyptic overtones have been ever more heard and are ever much heard today, often related to climate. For example, according to Roy Scranton, we are doomed. Now what? We must, he says, learn to die in the Anthropocene. Not that I agree, but, but he says so. Uh, th that is a much more engaging kind of statement for some people, at least, who are forced to swallow Trump tweets every day. Then it may be sort of sobering to hear about th learning to die. So, and of course, Trump himself is not very managerial at all. Now, PB language on the contrary, grew out of a remaining lingering belief in science as the deal maker. <laughs> we, said, we said in the papers, basically, look, we know what and where the boundaries are, or at least approximately we know. And then we have a responsibility as humanity, as a polity, to stick to them. And it was rational. I think it is very rational, in fact. So it was a message sent, I think, from the still valid world of globalization, or from the flat earth, as Thomas Friedman called it, or as you one often said in those years, a level playing field, or as it says in the 2009 paper, a planetary playing field. So science sets the stage, puts up the rules of the game, and then blows the whistle, and hopefully we all play fair and fix the planet. Uh, the world, in fact, seemed to go for a while in that direction, with its ups and downs. Paris 2015 was certainly an up. But pressure came from two sides. First, from those that argued that humanity precisely doesn't exist as one entity. We, we are divided. And that has to do with equity. We must also share responsibility in some innovative ways, they argued. We just cannot pretend that this can be navigated around. And this was, an, I think, an inevitable heritage from the old sustainability debates and the Brundtland report that had never been really fully resolved, despite all the ingenuity. And this is much worse in 2019 than it was in 1987 when the Brundtland report appeared, because the inequalities within nations have also skyrocketed. But you know all this, I just uh, remind you. And then, also, the pressure came from the bullies who didn't accept any rules at all. The new self-centered nationalists that have mushroomed up around the world in precisely this decade. They are often climate deniers, some are more religious than they are rational, uh, and so on. Now, none of these two very influential groups are, in fact, terribly interested in planetary boundaries. So, let me give you an example. When you read the best-selling 2019 book, The Un Uninhabitable Earth, the story of the future, based on what science tells us of this coming century, by New York Magazine journalist David Wallace Wells, you find not a single word about planetary boundaries and no mention of any of the authors of it. Same thing with Perrin Seltzer's book on the formation of the global environment since the 1970s, the post-war origins of the global environment that came last year. Well, actually, it does appear in footnote number one, <laughs> and not heard about then for 379 pages. But Anthropocene is all over the place, and all the self-proclaimed doomsday preachers are there, uh, including Nietzsche, Rachel Carson, and Bruno Latour. So, I emphasize this slight difference. Let me also say about The Un Uninhabitable Earth is a book with many limitations. I actually think it's quite poor. It's also very US-centered. But it remains, I think, somewhat of a yardstick of some kind of public discussions going on right now. A yardstick of what? Well, some kind of impact, another kind of impact than the ones we've been talking about so far this morning. Now, in the science world, where we count citations, it has more impact 
than most of this, the PB papers, and probably because it is precisely not an imaginary, but an empirically based and theoretically and conceptually very sound framework. Or perhaps even, and here I come to my running off things, even a technology. <laughs> uh, I'm starting to be affected by the fact that I'm at KTH, actually. I start talking about technology. But with, with a particular purpose. Uh, in the by now quite long history of the environment, we have seen a growth of what I have started to call during this decade, actually, also during this decade, environing technologies. Um, systemic observation-based quantified features of the natural world that have been turned into governable objects. And that is part of the background of this ERC um, project that I mentioned. Uh, and I will show you just a few examples of how you can think about this. Well, we have satellites, and you see which are, I think, an environmental technology, one of the prime of them, and they turn into some of these uh, quite objective and objectified uh, representations of changes in nature. Here is climate and sea ice. Uh, cryosphere is one of those elements. Very much uh, uh, lots of infrastructure that goes into the research. Or you can switch to uh, this technology that we used in an actually related paper based partly on work in the Resilience Center about ecosystem services as a technology, in this case of globalization, a paper I wrote with Hendrik many years ago, uh, Hendrik Anderson, without thinking about later being able to develop these ideas. Uh, you can think of assessments of different kinds also as a technology whereby you somehow produce this, this, these, these um, governable objects. And among these, I think one can look at the planetary boundaries framework as a kind of grand synthesis, a particularly towering achievement of environmental technologies uh, and um, uh, integrating actually many of the others. So this is how you can think about these things, I think. You can look at these, a certain a long history by now of pro producing these governable objects that are somehow standing. Uh, some, somebody mentioned the biosphere, and I must say we're quite in inspired by work by um, Leah Aronofsky at Harvard, her dissertation last year, where she studies precisely the, how the biosphere became a governable object. And in that regard, the PB framework falls into a pattern of a longer history here. So it links it to the past as well. The question now is whether this tradition of scaling environmental governance from the national to the global will continue uninterrupted. And then I should round off by saying that in this book, in the middle here, uh, that we co-author, the three of us on the right-hand side there, uh, The Environmental History of the Idea, we still see this as possible. Uh, and that is why we have put planetary boundaries as a major feature of the last chapter of the book, entitled The Earth is One, but the world is not. This book has been in the making for the better part of the lifespan of the PB articles. We share, I think, the same basic outlook, the authors of the book and the authors of the Nature paper back in 2009. But maybe, <laughs> the question I will leave you with, maybe we are perhaps all ghosts from the past, thinking like this. Uh, as we see the world changing now, other things are going on that we need to take into account. Activism seems to be back very, very strong. Agonistic as well. Conflict, doom, values, passion. Many dimensions of life on Earth that we somehow had no boundaries for. And again, I think I would like to refer to this fantastic poem that we heard in the morning. Let me, as a final word, cite Wittgenstein about boundaries. He says, uh, he who wants to put a boundary to human thought has to think on both sides of that boundary. Yeah.